Okay, I should probably note that abiogenesis is not evolution. Abiogenesis deals with the origin of life, where evolution deals with the origin of species, but I include it in this video anyway because I find it interesting, so... Fuck off. Now, although the first known life forms on Earth popped up around 3.7 billion years ago in the Archean Eon, Archean Eon, a Archean Eon, fuck me, it's speculated that Earth's first life forms could have appeared as far back as 4.5 billion years ago in the Hadeon Eon. Now, there are three major hypotheses to how life began creation, panspermia, and abiogenesis. Now, creation describes the notion that the first life appeared on Earth through an intelligent creator, albeit either a supernatural or natural one. Now, this is another more deistic creationist perspective that places a supernatural creator at the st very start of the universe, and he's the one, or it's, I guess, it's the one that started off the Big Bang. But we're not really going to bother with that since that's over 14 billion years ago, and it doesn't really tackle the same question the other three hypotheses do. Now, panspermia describes the notion that life formed somewhere else, like, I don't know, let's say for example Mars, and then came to Earth on something like an asteroid. Now, abiogenesis describes the process of non-organic chemicals reacting together to form organic compounds, and then those organic compounds reacting to form life. I'll go a bit more in depth on that in a moment. Now, with these first two hypotheses, I see a bit of a problem. With creation, you're still left with the question, well, where did the creators come from? And, well, la di da you're now back to square one. Now, with a supernatural creator, however, you can evoke a special pleading fallacy and say that it was, and well, and is, I guess, eternal. However, to do that, you have to first prove the supernatural, which, by definition, supersedes the natural, so... Have fun. Now, I actually think panspermia is pretty valid, I and mean, we have found Mars rock that's fallen to Earth that has evidence of life in it. Possible evidence. It's it's possible evidence with with a cat with a capital maybe. However, just like creation, panspermia still suffers with the question: Well, if life came from over there, then where did that life come from? And then you still need something like abiogenesis to explain that. So, abiogenesis. Now, a quick caveat, I did mention that abiogenesis is still just a hypothesis, and, well, it is, so either some or all of this could be completely untrue. But, since I'm not bothered to say probably at the start of every sentence, he is just, he is a bunch of them. Uh, just insert them at the beginning of every claim I make, so... I mean, unless it's a factual one, but I, ah, oh, you'll figure it out. So around four and a half billion years ago, Earth, or another planet, but let's just keep it simple here, was just a big old pool of chemicals. Now, chemicals are going to do what chemicals do and react with each other, and some of these reactions will form compounds called monomers. Now, the four types of monomers that we're going to be focusing on are carbohydrates, or monosaccharides, fats, or fatty acids, proteins, or amino acids, and nucleic acids, or nucleotides. Now, if you know anything about biochemistry, you'll know that monomers are the building blocks for polymers. So our monomers come together to form, well, Polymers, you're, you're following along good. But we'll get back to those later, because there's a problem. So you've probably been looking at all this and thought, wow, this all seems softly simple. And, well, as much as I have been oversimplifying things, uh, like a lot, that being the understatement of this eon. So much so that any biochemist watching this probably just quit science out of protest. Because abiogenesis is incessantly more complex than I've given it credit for in this video and also more complex than I can cover in this video. And not only that, but just like evolution was when that was still a hypothesis, there's more than just one form of abiogenesis, and in this video I've kind of just made a blanket for the entire thing. So just keep that in mind going on. The principles themselves are actually quite simple, it's just chemical reactions making other chemicals. But there is one thing I've been missing out. See, these reactions, especially the polymers come together, would probably need some form of catalyst to get things moving on. Now these catalysts can be like heat from a hydrothermic vent or a lightning strike, or some form of chemical catalyst. Now as an interesting little tidbit, Stanley Miller and Harold Urey in their famous Miller-Urey experiment was actually able to create amino acids by simulating the inorganic compounds thought to have been on Earth over 4 billion years ago, and then using sparks to simulate lightning. But time digressing. But the problem stems not only from the fact we don't really have any demonstrations of how most of the chemicals specifically came together, but there's also the fact that these reactions could have happened on a completely different planet with the whole panspermia thing. And also, since the oldest rocks we currently have are only 4.28 billion years old, I know, only 4.28 billion, a by is annoyingly confined to the realm of hypothesis. But enough of me lamenting, let's go back to our little polymers. Now, you may be wondering, what's so special about polymers? See, these polymers in particular are a type of rudimentary RNA molecule that can do this. Yeah. See, what's great about these molecules is that they can take in other chemicals, let's just call it food, and then use that food to create a near-identical version of itself. Near identical, and that's incredibly important. Okay, if you're only going to listen to one thing I say in this entire video, then let it be what's about to come next, because this one principle is going to be the main reason why every single plant, animal, fungi, and any other self replicating organism exists, and thus is going to be the driving principle behind almost everything I say preceding this, and it's called natural selection. 
and its simplicity is frankly the reason why I love evolution so much. Now back to what I said about self replication being imperfect. When an organism, I'm going to say organism because this applies to more than just our little RNA molecules, reproduces, its offspring is going to be a little different from its parents, and we'll call these mutations. Now these mutations are completely random, and this alone wouldn't really do much, especially since most mutations are either unbeneficial or benign to an organism's ability to reproduce. However, that's where our boy natural selection comes to play. Now although the mutations are random, natural selection is anything but that. In principle, natural selection states that if an organism's mutations makes it better suited to reproduce in its environment around it, then it will most likely outcompete the other organisms, and then that mutation that made it so successful would then be passed down to its offspring and would become more abundant in the common gene pool until another beneficial mutation comes along and so on and so forth, gradually changing the organism over time. Now, given enough time and environmental change, an organism's mutations can become so abundant that it becomes a completely different animal when compared to its ancestor. Or plants, or fungi, or uh, yeasts. I should also note that two organisms with the same ancestor can not only mutate to become a different species than its ancestor, but can also mutate to become a different species than each other. This is called speciation, and Mazel Tov, you've now got the theory of evolution. Kinda. Remember, at this period of time we're still dealing with self-replicating molecules, and we haven't really moved on to life yet. Debatably. Probably. Kinda. I... Um, so we're now in a bit of a grey area which begs the question, are we dealing with abiogenesis, evolution or both? And I'm just not bothered enough to even begin to try to answer that question, so let's just put our fingers in our ears as we rush through the rest of this. So the RNA keeps reproducing and mutating, developing a membrane along the way and forming a protocell, which is like a cell but proto, and then the protocell keeps reproducing and mutating until it becomes an actual cell. And now we're definitely talking about evolution. <laughs> So, because of the whole speciation thing, we now have an overwhelming multitude of different species of single-celled organisms, but we can separate them into two distinct groups, archaea and bacteria. What's the difference? Well, well, it's mostly just differences between the chemical compounds that make up the stuff like their membranes and other things. Frankly, the differences between the two don't really matter too much in the context of this video, but what you do need to remember is that archaea share more similarities with eukaryotic cells than bacteria do, which we'll get into later because archaea and bacteria are not eukaryotes, they are prokaryotes. What's prokaryotes? Prokaryotes are cells that don't have a defined nucleus, and instead it's DNA and RNA are just kind of sits there in its own spindle of stuff, and sits in a very basic cauldron of chemical reactions that keeps it going. And the main way they reproduce is through a process called asexual binary fission. Basically they make a copy of their DNA and then they go boop. Now there are other ways that they reproduce, like through DNA exchange, but right now let's just focus on the split and boop method. Now because prokaryotes are so simple, they can go boop quite a lot. I mean a lot a lot. Like super a lot a lot. So you can bet your tight little tissue that in not too long a time frame we're going to get quite a lot of different prokaryotes everywhere. One species of which is called cyanobacteria. Now as I said, prokaryotes are extremely simple, and although this has made them extremely successful, I mean seriously, I can't stress this enough, just just to put it in perspective, your body is made up of more bacteria and archaea than all of your animal cells combined. We are riddled. But anyway, although their simplicity made them extremely successful, about three and a half billion years ago, one little archaea really wanted to be something more complex. E he I don't care, said the cyanobacteria who were too busy being green, forming stromatolites and eating sunlight. Oh, excuse me. Now, because of the whole eating sunlight thing, not only did that make them very successful, like even more successful I should say, along the continental margins and other shallow waters, but they also started producing oxygen as a byproduct. I'm sure that's not going to do anything drastic on a global scale. Oops, I dropped my pen. Let me just go and pick it up. Ah, there we go. Got my- Jesus Christ! Okay, so firstly, what the fuck just happened? Secondly, was this all because of cyanobacteria? And thirdly, where did my pen go? Well, to answer the second question, although cyanobacteria may have not been the only prokaryotes with the ability to photosynthesize, they were definitely at the forefront of this. And, well, exactly what this is, well, that's going to take a little more time to explain. Now, although cyanobacteria were creating oxygen around the middle of the Archaeon Aeon, we don't really see its effects until the start of the Protozoic Aeon, since not only did the cyanobacteria have to become more abundant first, but Earth's waters at the time were also saturated with iron, possibly making them green. Maybe. I mean, even if they were green, it still raises the age-old question, if your ferrous content makes you green, but no one has eyes to see it yet, does it really make a sound? But anyway, because of all the iron in the water, the produced oxygen wasn't actually going into the atmosphere, but was instead reacting with the iron and forming iron oxide. However, 2.3 billion years ago, most of the iron has now reacted and fallen out of solution, and now not only do we have banded iron formations, but the oxygen is now going straight into the atmosphere, which does two things. One of these things that it did was oxidise the atmosphere and displace most of the methane. 
a greenhouse gas. Now, as we all know, too much greenhouse gas causes global warming. So, as you might guess, too little greenhouse gas causes global cooling. Now, how much global cooling can one little species of bacteria make? A fucking worldwide glaciation. The Huronian glaciation, to be precise, which quite possibly caused a snowball Earth, which would have looked awesome. Now, the second thing that this little bacterium did was cause a mass extinction event. It looks like someone ought to... chill out. Fuck off! See, most of the prokaryotes at this time were anaerobic, meaning that they lived primarily without oxygen. But not only were most of them anaerobic, but they were so anaerobic that oxygen was toxic to them. So they just died. To refer to what cyanobacteria did as biblical would be an understatement. All by basically farting. Now, whilst once again tied up with genocidal guffs, I missed out one important event that happened at the start of the glaciation. See, going back to the Archean Aeon, it's around 2.7 billion years ago and our little Archea is still wishing to become something more complex. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I- Oh. We now have the first, albeit a bit rudimentary, eukaryotes. What's a eukaryote? Well, unlike the prokaryote that has its DNA just bundled up inside it, a eukaryote stores its DNA in a defined nucleus. What also separates eukaryotes from prokaryotes is their complexity. Where the innards of a prokaryote are more or less just a cauldron of various chemical reactions, a eukaryote's different processes were carried out in designated organelles. And to better explain how these came about, I think we should go back to how the first eukaryotes formed. Now, the leading theory was through a process called endosymbiosis. So think less and more. I'm a photosynthetic prokaryote, and I'm an anaerobic heterotrophic prokaryote, and I'm bigger than both of you. Terry, what the fuck? Or to put it another way, think of it as fusing a squirrel to your body and then sharing your organs with it. You know? Now one of the benefits of having your various biological processes contained in different isolated organelles is that you can now do a multitude of different processes with higher efficiency instead of just having a weird chemical soup trying to do it all at once. Want to be able to photosynthesize? Use a chloroplast. Need more storage? Get yourself some vacuoles. Need some more energy? They have a mitochondrion for that. Also, I should probably note, although some of the absorbed organisms were probably of bacteria, most of them would have probably been archaea because of the similarities they have with eukaryotes, like I said earlier. Now, one of the ways eukaryotes reproduce is through mitosis. Now, what's the difference between mitosis and binary fission? Um... The name? I'm oversimplifying. In reality, there are quite a few differences, but the same principle of double your stuff then boop still applies. However, because they're so much more complex, eukaryotic cells take a lot longer to do the whole boop thing than prokaryotes, which is one of their downsides compared to their simpler ancestors. However, there's another way that eukaryotes can reproduce, and that's called meiosis. Now, what's the difference between meiosis and mitosis? Also, what's the difference between meiosis, eosis, and ososis? I said fuck off. Well, in mitosis, the resulting two daughter cells have the same number of chromosomes as its parent, while in meiosis, the resulting four daughter cells only have half, and we'll call these gametes, or gametes if you're American. So, how do you get your chromosomes back? Well, you're going to need another cell with the other, let's call them male chromosomes, to fuse with the daughter cells, and congratulations, you just invented sex. Now, one of the advantages of sexual reproduction from an evolutionary standpoint is the new genetic variability you now get, and this can drastically help descendants adapt to changing environments. And speaking of changing environments, where were we? Oh yeah, so just to recap, cyanobacteria, genocidal farts, huronian glaciation. Now enters our eukaryotes, new and improved with all their DNA and RNA being stored in their nucleus. And their mitochondria. And some of the other organelles. Anyway, fun fact about extinction events is that they can pave the way for a boom in the growth of the surviving organisms since, well, there's certainly less competition now, isn't there? So, with the single-celled organism's version of free real estate, the now oxygenated globe starts to warm back up, forming small shallow seas. Hilarious fact about warm shallow waters is that they're great for organisms to thrive in, being nutrient-rich and with no shortage of sunlight. And with supercontinent Rodinia breaking up, absolutely bellyaching fact about shifting continents is that they're a great way for an organism to diversify, since you can separate an organism and move them to a completely different environment, with enough time for them to adapt and evolve since continents, and I hope you know this, move incredibly slowly. You now get the the perfect opportunity for organisms not only to thrive but to diversify. So you now have thriving colonies of eukaryotes doing eukaryote things like multiplying and and floating and multiply. Look, there's not much to being a single cell organism, okay? However, between 800 million to 1 billion years ago, you had a eukaryote minding its own business when. Hey. Uh, hi. Want to see something cool? Um. Uh. 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 So the eukaryotes start to fuse together in a process called I can't for the life of me find the name of it, and bish bash bosh you've now got a metazoan. 
also known as an animal. Granted, although metazoan is technically synonymous with animal, the name highlights a very pertinent difference animal cells have with plant and fungi cells, with zoon meaning animal, and meta meaning change, and we'll be focusing on the change part. Now one of the major differences is that animal cells, unlike plant and fungi cells, is that animal cells lack a cell wall. This means that animals can experience a lot more change in appearance than plant and fungi. For example, do you really think this alien's gonna become a human being? But he does. Or a more extreme example being a caterpillar completely metamorphosizing into a butterfly. Or an even more extreme example would be the life cycle of a jellyfish. That shit's fucked. Now you may be wondering what this has to do with evolutionary history. Well, I, I just thought it was interesting, fuck off. However, something that has a little more to do with evolution and is kind of interesting is plant cells have chloroplasts that allows them to conduct photosynthesis. This makes them autotrophs, meaning that they make their own food whereas animals and fungi are heterotrophs and rely on consuming outside sources for food and nutrients. Now some more heterotrophic plants would evolve later down the line but let's just keep this simple. So you may be wondering then, if animals are heterotrophs and fungi are heterotrophs, does that mean fungi are closer related to animals than they are to plants? Yes. Yes they are. However, talking about plants and fungi, these will also form alongside animals. So we've now got our first fauna, faunus, not faunus, flora and fungi. Fauna being animals, flora being plants, and fungi being, well, fungi. And faunus being a mythical race of human in an animated web series. But that's like 800 million years into the future, so let's not bother talking about that just yet. Talking specifically about animals now, because I'm a tribalistic cunt, the first metazones would probably be sea sponges, since one, they're like the simplest metazones we know, and two, the oldest chemical fossils we have for early metazones are similar to the chemicals produced by modern sea sponges today. Chemical fossils being fossils not made from the organism itself, but the chemicals it would have produced. Very serious fact about sea sponges is that they have cells called cyanocytes that still have their little phylogia, or remnants of their phlegia, which would have helped their single-celled organisms swim about, like a little vestigial organelle. Granted, we have a vestigial organ that's only purpose is to be an actual time bomb, I mean, so... I can't, I really can't imagine what a sea sponge must think of us, but I digress. Now you may be thinking, sea sponges aren't that fun. And you're right. So we'll let evolution take its course for about another two to three hundred billion years. I really can't stress enough how long it takes evolution to do things. So we've given them some time and our metazoans have started to diversify and get more complicated. But hold on a sec, you may be thinking, wait, the first group of diverse life forms? Does this mean we're entering the- And yes, it's that period. The one people keep thinking of when you talk about ancient animals. The period everyone keeps mistakenly thinking that was responsible for the first multicellular life. The period that everyone knows the name of for some reason. Like I'm not complaining, it's just a bit weird that everyone seems to know the name of this period for some reason. Yep, it's that period. The period I'm about to say now. You guessed it, the period we all know and love. Say it with me, it's the Edicarian periods. Yay. So, what's the Edicarian period like? Well, for the metazoans, we could talk about plants and fungi but they're boring. They're either stuck to the ground, crawling around on the ground, floating about, not swimming, just floating, or shallowly burrowing. Now, a quality everyone shares in this period is that everyone's a very soft boy right now. Mostly because there's also a very distinct lack of predators in this period as well. But why can't I be a predator? Said the first predator, predating nom, nom. on the first predity. Ouch! Said the first prey, being preyed on by the first prey, uh, prey, uh, let's just call them prey, predator and prey. Ouch! Said the first prey, being preyed on by the first predator. I wish my body was harder so I could repel his attacks, he said while evolving a harder body to repel the predator's attacks. Ouch! Said the predator, no longer able to prey on the prey. I wish my predator bits were a bit harder so I could prey on the prey easier, he said, evolving harder predators a bit so he could prey on the prey again. Ouch said the prey being preyed on by the predator. I wish my body was harder to repel his attacks, he said, while evolving an even harder body to repel the predator's attacks. Youch said the predator, no longer being able to prey on the prey. I wish my predator bits were a bit harder so I could- And it was this predator's prey arms race, along with some other evolutionary boosters, that would spark a very sudden, rapid evolutionary expansive. Almost explosive in a way. 